Okay. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I, will, I will share with you our experience in uh, CDG diagnosis and follow-up of children here uh, in, in Spain. All the data that I will show you uh, has been collected in collaboration with other centers, uh, research centers for diagnosis, uh, like the Hospital Clinic in Barcelona uh, by Dr. Briones, also from the CEDEM, the, a center for uh, genetic diagnosis in, in, in errors of metabolism, uh, where Belen Perez and Celia Perez Cerdan is working, and uh, our hospital, which is Hospital San Juan de Deu in Barcelona. So this is the, the, the CDG diagnosis in Spain. Uh, we, we have in total uh, 79 genetically confirmed patients, and uh, 42 are pending a definite diagnosis. This is what we call uh, X uh, phenotypes. Uh, the, the most frequent ones are uh, CDG1A, 63 patients, and the rest are uh, very rare with uh, one or four patients for each uh, defect. This is the genotype of our children from uh, 50 55 genotyped uh, CDG1A patients, we have 43 different combinations of mutations. Uh, this is uh, very, uh, this makes very difficult to, uh, to make an association between the genotype and the phenotype uh, in most children. It means that when you get the mutations of your child, it's very difficult uh, for the clinician to make a prognosis. Uh, regarding this child, because there are very few children that share the same mutations. And <clears throat> here uh, we want to show you uh, the most frequent uh, mutation, uh, in this, um, allele mutations. Here you can see that our mutations are a bit different from those reported from other countries, like in Northern European countries. Uh, the most frequent mutation in, in, the, in other European countries is the uh, R141H, and in our uh, population, it only represents 22% of all the disease alleles. <coughs> this work has been uh, published and I want uh, to share with you some data from this paper. Uh, um, and 75% uh, of these children are currently alive. 30% of them are actually adults. From the mutations uh, found, 15 of them are specific of the Mediterranean area and are present in Spain and in Greece and in other uh, countries from the Mediterranean. We have a lower prevalence of severe mutations compared with our countries. We have uh, uh, many mutations with a high residual activity, which, make the, uh, which is translated to the fact that many children are milder, have milder phenotypes that, than in other countries. And the 80% 80 per, uh, 80 of mutations are missense mutations that affect the folding and stability of the protein. Uh, that, and contributing to the milder phenotype. This is what Dr. Belen Perez calls a misfolding or conformational disease, and she will explain in the FEM that uh, a specific therapies uh, can be applied to th uh, these children like, that we call chaperones. So now I will uh, show you uh, the, the patients that we attend in the Hospital San Juan de Deu, the children that, that I know well. Uh, uh, that I have visited in the outpatient clinic. We have uh, in total only 15 children with uh, CDG1A. Uh, four of them died, Mo two, uh, most of them in the first months of life, and an adult patient died from a stroke at the age of 28. Now we are attending 11 patients, two of them are adults, and nine are children. The mean age is eight years, and the range is from two to 15 years. These are our patients. Uh, I want to highlight here that we have five children with a very mild phenotype, very mild neurological phenotype with a very good quality of life. The other are classic, classical phenot uh, phenotypes. Here you have the residual activity and the mutations. I will uh, 
talk a little bit about the neurological involvement in these children. When we have a child with uh, CDG1A, uh, the first signs that we see as a uh, child neurologist are uh, the axial hypotonia, which is quite severe. There is uh, always, usually, in, at least in classical phenotypes, a, a motor delay. Uh, we can see dysmetry that is uh, present in the first months when the child tries to reach objects, like a tremor. And uh, also there used to be uh, an uh, abnormal eye movement, like a strabismus or a paroxysmal tonic up gaze deviation. I hope I have time to show you here what an example of what I am trying to explain that uh, you have all seen in your children that I want to share with you one of our passions that the, the parents wanted to to share here. Okay, it's not possible. No problem. We don't have many time, so yes. <laughs> don't worry. Well, so uh, these f uh, five children with a uh, mild neurological phenotype, um, this, this is the data from them. They acquired uh, unsupported seed between 11 and 12 months. They all uh, have an, an assisted gait, very functional gait, which was achieved between the months of 27 and 30. They acquired the sphincter control at a normal age, between two and three and they developed language at around the age of two years. Uh, and in those that we have performed a cognitive assessment, they have a normal EQ, which is many times in the lower limit of the reference ra range. They, these all five children are attending a mainstream school. Uh, some of them do need the support of a special education teacher in some areas. And what we can see in all these children is that there is a vermian atrophy, which is non-progressive. For example, this child is nine, 19 months, and you can see here when you compare with a control uh, patient of the same age, that the vermins of his cerebellum is a little smaller than normal. And also can be seen here. A more important affecting the inferior vermis than the superior vermis. This is very mild compared with the classical phenotypes. And also what we, can, what we see when, do the, when we do the follow-up of these children is that there is no progression at all. On MRI, uh, the, the cerebellum uh, looks the same. There is no volume loss that is uh, seen in many children with the classical phenotype. So it is a stable condition, at least by MRI and by the clinical picture, you, you cannot uh, think of degeneration in these cases. And sometimes what we have seen in these children is that they are quite difficult to diagnose, uh, bio, to perform the biochemical diagnosis, because many times the isoelectric focusing pattern uh, is normal. Oy. For example, this child had, uh, it was very difficult to diagnose this child. Uh, the first was, uh, was impaired, there was a, con a high amount of this allotransferrin, but this analysis was performed with the child had a chicken pox. Later on, uh, because her phenotype was very mild and there were doubts about the diagnosis, a second analysis was performed and the peak of this allotransferrin was quite reduced by uh, visually, the isoelectric focusing was almost normal. And then on the third analysis, it was abnormal again, which means that uh, these mild phenotypes may be underdiagnosed, and we have to, to use a very high clinical suspicion uh, for the diagnosis. One minute. Okay. okay. The classical phenotype, on the contrary, uh, these children are more severely affected from the neurological point of view, Many of them do not walk without assistance, and when they walk, they do it at a very late, late age, and they all have cognitive impairment. What we see seeing signs that make us think of a poor neurological outcome is uh, when we, for example, see an impaired head growth, 
when the heart circumfer circumference is not growing at the normal rate, for example, in this child. This is a, a sign of poor prognosis, and when you perform a, a cognitive assessment, you see that the EQ is uh, always affected. The cerebral involvement in these children with the classical phenotype is uh, more, uh, more, more severe, and the cerebellum uh, is very, very, very reduced in volume, and you can also see that there is a progression, a, a progressive reduction of the size when you perform sequential MRIs, as well as there is also a reduction in the, uh, in the volume of the pons. When you perform this histological examination, there is neuronal loss, and for example, these uh, slices are from a child that died in the neonatal period, and at this age, you could already see that there was a loss of neurons in the granular uh, cell layers. These granular cell layers act as a germinal layer for the development of the cerebellum. So you can imagine that if this is affected uh, in the first month, that the cerebellum will not develop uh, properly. Then the, other, the last slide is to show you that uh, the children with the classical phenotype usually uh, associate uh, extra neurological involvement. Most of them have enteropathy. They are uh, fed by a uh, nasogastric tube or by uh, gastrostomy. They usually have uh, liver cytolysis and it is more frequent the association with uh, coagulation defects in the classical phenotypes. On the contrary, the children with mild phenotype uh, do not have or very few have extra neurological involvement. We, can, we have detected that uh, there is an important decrease of coagulation factors that uh, many other uh, physicians and the, the, uh, the antithrombin, they have a decrease of anti and procoagulation uh, factors. And in some authors have reported that this decrease of coagulation factors correlate with uh, liver involvement as, as in our children. We have had for children with vascular events, uh, one adult patient died from a stroke at the age of 28, and uh, uh, two infants died from bleeding processes. This, for example, is a, a, a scan from a neonat that had a, 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 hemorrhagic, a ventricular hemorrhage, hemorrhage when he was born. And then he had another stroke-like episode at the age of seven, and he never again had any other, another vascular event. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Del Corral will show you very interesting data uh, regarding coagulation uh, uh, problems in these children. And then the last slide is to show you that we have followed up three uh, adult patients with a classical phenotype. And what I c we can say is that they all uh, have a cognitive deficit that remains stable. Mm, they are, have a very important motor disturbance uh, due to a combination of ataxia and weakness. They walk short distances but uh, with living support but need a wheelchair for daily activities. They all have retinal pigmentary degeneration and peripheral neuropathy. You can see here this child, very, very uh, thin uh, lower limbs which reflect uh, an abnormal uh, a neuropathy. And also the absence of secondary sexual characters, which is typ typical of hypogonadism, like uh, our colleague from Brazil was explaining to you. It's very typical of this disorder. And that's all. Thank you for your attention.